Hello and welcome to The Wild Side. This is your host, Caitlin Kike, and that was The Weepies with Citywide Rodeo. And on today's show, I am revisiting kind of a favorite theme of mine and one that I have talked about a little bit in the past, kind of here and there on the show, and that is the impact of human settlements on biodiversity. So there's a lot of interest in thinking about whether cities and uh, particular types of habitats and structures and features that we find within cities can be useful for wildlife. And of course people are interested in this because we do have um, a large population currently living in cities and the population keeps going up, cities keep getting bigger, and so this seems to be the type of habitat that we're going to have a lot of in the future. And so of course people want to see whether or not that particular type of habitat is any good for wildlife because I think most people are interested in having wildlife in all types of places that they live, not just out in the country. And if we can figure out what sorts of things we can do to make cities a bit more pleasant for animals and um, plants and all other sorts of species, then of course I think most of us would be interested in finding a way to achieve those things. So this is kind of a burgeoning area of scientific research. And I've read a couple of recent papers to kind of give you an idea of some of the things that are happening right now in that field. So what are the questions that are being asked and what are the directions in which research is going? And the first of the studies that I want to talk about today is one that is interested in thinking about kind of historical cities that people used to live in and modern cities and thinking about the patterns that we used to see back in ancient cities, are these the same sorts of things we see today, or are there different sorts of things that we see today, and what does this mean for wildlife? And the whole reason that the researchers were asking this question is that currently we have some areas, so some types of cities and some areas within those types of cities, that tend to actually be quite good for biodiversity. So if you think about New York City, for example, you've got that uh, gigantic Central Park, and Central Park is associated with all sorts of species. For example, in the springtime, a lot of birders will go there and look at species that you really can't find anywhere else because those birds know that that habitat is kind of a little island in a sea of cityscape, and so they all can go right there and find everything that they need in terms of places to roost and things to eat and things like that. So there are these green spaces in some cities that seem to have quite a lot of diversity and to provide habitat for quite a lot of species. And this is particularly true not just in places, you know, big parks in the middle of cities, but kind of over larger spaces and in more different places, kind of at the fringes of cities where you've got kind of urban sprawl, um, but not kind of the negative association that we normally uh, attached to that phrase. So the kind of sprawl where you've got kind of city-ish type habitat but with lots of green involved. So the sorts of kind of suburby type places where people are generally living or they have kind of uh, recreational spaces associated with the city but not actually within the city itself. And these researchers were looking at that thinking, is this a, t a sort of feature that we kind of will see a, an attached uh, an attachment with every city that we have, or is this kind of just a, a phase that we're going through in some of these areas right now? Can we expect that after a time, as cities become denser and denser and there are more people and more structures, eventually those areas are going to get built over, they're going to disappear, and cities will no longer be quite uh, as nice for the wildlife? So this is what they're interested in looking at in this particular um, study. Now, one of the things that they have thought about is the fact that you can kind of investigate remains of ancient settlements in order to kind of get an idea of the tra trajectory of how those sort of settlements are, um, are built up and settled over time. So if we have a lot of wildlife in an area and then people go in and they kind of chase some of that wildlife out as they build up, can we expect to see that certain pattern happening no matter where you are in the world or is that kind of a unique thing? And they wanted to look at these trajectories and think about those ancient patterns and where they ultimately ended up. So they can kind of look back at the different strata of uh, archaeological evidence and get an idea of what sort of biodiversity there was from the beginning of that settlement to the end of that settlement and then compare that to the beginning to potentially the future end of the settlements that we are currently inhabiting today. And hopefully they can take all of this archaeological evidence and 
put it into the context of conservation and urban planning. So not just thinking about, uh, as we're building now, what are the species that we can um, preserve by kind of having certain patterns, but also in the future, if we maybe have the ability to reintroduce certain features, to demolish buildings and put in parks, etc., you know, might we be able to achieve kind of higher biodiversity levels than we have today by mirroring some of the things that we had in the past in these ancient settlements and also in our own settlements before they became kind of what they are today as they were in their initial stages. So in the current study what they looked at was 13 different sites in the southwestern portion of the Near East. So kind of, you know, the cradle of humanity where some of these very early human settlements can be found. Now in this area Ancient urban sites can be identified because they're associated with large mounds, uh, presumably associated with kind of um, having defenses, basically. So I think this is kind of comparable to the hill forts that we would have seen here in this region of the UK. So basically, you're, you don't have maybe um, gigantic structures from the very beginning. You don't have those big walls that you might eventually build or big buildings. But you do have kind of mounds that delineate the city from the habitat around it. So you can early on find these sorts of sites and then you can see over time that you have other changes to the substrate and other changes to the area. So for example the introduction of foundations and buildings and trash heaps and all those sorts of things that you could quite easily use to identify a place where humans have lived. Now in this portion of the Near East, urbanization began in the 5th to the 4th millennia BCE. So obviously there's, these are some incredibly old remains that they're looking at. But they were interested in focusing particularly on areas that were already established and quite stable in the late 2nd and early 1st millennium BCE. So that's the Late Bronze Age and the Iron Age. And obviously those are quite important times because you've kind of reached certain benchmarks Human densities are at a certain level, cities are at a certain level, uh, and I think that's why they focused on those times, is because they wanted to get to kind of a critical mass of human densities. And they also wanted to get to the point where the humans are actually building real structures and those structures are staying there year round and they really are kind of a noticeable city rather than kind of a village or a town or something on a bit smaller of a scale. Now at these sites it's quite easy to find the remains of small mammals such as rodents and insectivores, so things like mice and voles and little things like that. And unlike livestock or pets, these are native animals, so you would have had, um, had these animals kind of coming into the settlements on their own volition, or they might have been there from the beginning and just hung on after the humans uh, kind of interfered and changed things. And this is better than using livestock or pets because livestock or pets would have been introduced by the people, their numbers would have been manipulated, their locations would have been manipulated, and so they don't necessarily really reflect kind of uh, the effect of the human settlements on nature and on wildlife uh, as so much as they just do on animals, period. And these guys are also wild commensals, so you might have had a lot of these animals actually uh, doing quite well among people, and so uh, coming in to live on purpose with people or kind of doing quite well once people were introduced. And so it's interesting uh, to, to use them because you have quite a large sample size potentially. Now the remains were excavated from different portions of the sites associated with different types of urban use and also from different times of the settlement's history. So as I said, they were able to look down at the different strata and find things of varying ages. And they also could do this at different locations, so in the center of the site, in the edge of the site, and so on and so forth. So you know you're kind of in the most densely populated and densely used area, and then kind of going out from that to ones that are a bit more um, what we would call maybe the suburbs, for example. And they found 11 different species assemblages from different time periods over six different urban sites plus six assemblages from three different rural sites so that they could compare what was happening at uh, the cities versus kind of the, the local habitat. And they also had four assemblages at sites that were kind of um, abandoned basically. So they knew that there had been some human settlements there at some point and then those were left behind and no longer uh, were being used by people. And the assemblages in this case means that these are just the groups of animals that they were able to find at these areas. So they were interested in looking at how many species and which species were found in each one of these different types of areas. And just thinking about that, you might guess that kind of um, 
the rural sites would have maybe the most diverse and perhaps also the largest number of specimens found. And then you would have something kind of intermediate at those sites that were once inhabited by people but then abandoned. And then you would have uh, the other extreme at the urban area. So you might have um, the, the fewest species or the fewest number of individuals. But then again, if you're thinking about commensals like mice or rats, you might actually expect for there to be even more of those in the human habitat. So you can kind of make predictions that go either way, but the point being that you would have this spectrum where rural and urban would be on either end, and the abandoned sites would be somewhere in the middle. <coughs> Excuse me. So overall, they were looking at two types of data from all of these samples that they were pulling out of the soil. One, they wanted to create a taxonomic list per site. So they had this idea of diversity and also general site ecology. So not just knowing the pure number of species, but also taking that information to think about what does this mean about what the site would have been like. So you know the certain preferences and life history characteristics of particular species. So if you know that those species are present or absent, you can kind of infer something about the habitat in which uh, you've collected those samples. The other thing they also wanted to do was create a similar taxonomic list within the different phases of settlement at each site. And this is how they were able to create that growth trajectory, so they had an idea of how the site was changing over time. So you'd want to see, do you have the same species all along, do you have uh, diversity increasing, do you have diversity decreasing, do you have total number increasing, do you have total number decreasing. So getting an idea of what sorts of changes you might expect for there to be in the animals living in this area once humans have been introduced and begun um, to build more and more on a particular site. And cumulatively, they were hoping that these two patterns together would allow them to get an idea of how urbanization in general is affecting the ecology of a site. So across all the 13 sites that they looked at, they found 1,619 specimens, so obviously that's been quite a lot of, of digging and um, meticulously pulling little tiny bones from the soil. And all of the specimens actually only fell into 10 different taxa, which is not really that many when you think about it. And that probably reflects the fact that, first of all, we're thinking about cities where you don't tend to have tons of diversity, even in the best of circumstances. And also, most of these areas are kind of, um, they tend to be kind of little oases where you've got, you know, a bit of desert around them. So maybe it's just not an incredibly diverse area to begin with. The more interesting pattern is that the rural and urban areas tended to have very distinct assemblages. So the rural areas tended to have much more variation than the urban sites, whereas the urban sites would have uh, kind of the same number of species over and over again. So they're more homogeneous. In urban areas, the archaeologists tend to find more mouse species and also white-toothed shrews. Now in rural and also the uh, abandoned sites, they found a lot of jurds, which are kind of like a little tunneling species that um, I guess kind of comparable to a mole in many cases. In rural sites, they found spiny mice at inhabited places and field voles at the abandoned areas. And so, that, you know, for each one of these, clearly there are distinct species that seem to be occurring over and over again in distinct type of sites. So the exact species isn't really that interesting so much as the, the, the mice and the shrews are quite different from the jurds. Um, the spiny mice and the field voles are quite different from those other animals. And all these guys are found consistently at basically one type of site over and over again. And they aren't found distributed across all of these sites. So you don't see lots of sharing from one habitat to the next. So all these species are known to similar sorts of areas and in similar sorts of associations with other species at other archaeological sites in the region. So none of this is really a surprise, it's just that no one has actually studied uh, these particular data in quite this way and constructed this kind of uh, growth trajectory and, and looked at it over time uh, and from a kind of a rural to urban gradient. So this is quite consistent, which means that these are representative samples that basically are indicating the sorts of things we would find at pretty much any domesticated site um, or nearby proximity of a domesticated site throughout the region. So this really probably does exemplify the urbanization trends in this Near East area of the world. Another thing that they found was that the taxonomic richness in urban and rural sites showed distinct differences. So in addition to seeing kind of um, particular species falling out in certain patterns, they also found that groups of species 
had some interesting trends. So for example, in urban settlements, there were significantly fewer overall species than in rural set areas. And this is something that we often mm -hmm. see today, although sometimes this result can be um, a bit thrown off by the fact that there are some species that do really well in cities, so things like pigeons, um, things like particular types of mosses maybe, or mushrooms. So various things like that that you might find over and over again simply because they do really well around people and so they kind of follow us around and flourish. But in general you tend to find that uh, urban areas do have uh, less richness than elsewhere and that is what these guys found here in a place that is thousands of years old. So clearly this is a pattern that happens over and over again throughout time as humans settle an area. The types of species, as I mentioned, were also notably different, but just uh, in addition to thinking about those specific animals, thinking about what they kind of represent, the ones that they found in urban areas were mostly what we refer to as human commensals. I mentioned this at the beginning of the show. So they're animals that tend to do really well around people, whether they have followed people there on purpose and then and done really well in those habitats, or whether they've been there from the beginning and simply adapt quite well once humans show up. So these are the species that are the pigeons, that are the house sparrows, that are the starlings. So the ones that seem to do pretty well everywhere. And a lot of the time, these tend to be kind of generalist species that are quite happy to live in lots of different types of little nooks and crannies, to take advantage of any different type of food source. Uh, they tend to be quite brave, and so they're happy to go out into a new environment and kind of check it out uh, a bit more quickly to... Um, utilize these new resources more quickly as well, so they're quite flexible in, in, in what they look at and what they use and how they interact with each other as well. So they, they tend to show characteristics where maybe they aren't going to fight as much when they're in quite high densities in those types of urban environments. So there are all sorts of characteristics that seem to predispose particular animals to doing quite well in human habitats. So most of the urban areas were containing these sorts of animals as opposed to the rural areas where you had um, the, a different type of species, species that are maybe a bit more specialist, they need very particular things and they can't do well without it, so when they don't find it in a city, they can't succeed very well. Also types of species that uh, just don't do very well with disturbance and tend to be a little bit more shy and retiring and they can't stand all the pollution and the noise and that sort of thing. And rural areas had larger number of those sorts of species than they saw in the urban sites. And this was true regardless of variations in the background environment, which you would expect to influence biodiversity to some extent. So this clearly was a pattern that was driven by whether or not these specimens were found in a city-type area or in a rural-type area, not by kind of the other um, general environmental fluctuations in, an, uh, in, in the overall site. So no matter which of the particular sites they were looking at, they found these same types of trends. So what does all of this mean? Well, clearly, human occupation is influencing which species can survive and thrive in these uh, areas. And this is something that these guys have seen now in these historical sites, and it's something that we see now today. And despite the fact that the urban sites varied in lots of different characteristics, so they had ones of different size, they had ones of different, um, in different geographic locations throughout the kind of uh, Middle East. They also had ones that had been occupied for different lengths of time. They still found these similarities in species assemblages. So the presence of people was clearly influencing the general ecological circumstances, but they aren't really sure how and why. So maybe the creation of mounds, those mounds that I mentioned that are kind of maybe the precursor to building up a city, Maybe those are affecting the movement of animals into and out of cities. So maybe these are just a bit too big, a bit too exposed, and so the animals don't want to crawl up over them and enter the city. Or again, maybe there are some animals that are trapped on the inside, and so they can't get out. Maybe there is soil impaction that's making it difficult for tunneling animals to, to burrow. So those jerds that I mentioned that were found at kind of the intermediate sites, Maybe those are animals that were excluded by the urban activity, and then once people abandoned it, the soil became a bit looser, it was no longer being trampled down by all that foot uh, traffic and all those buildings, and so those animals were able to recolonize and do quite well. Maybe the presence of domestic species was driving off predators. So there are people that are in there doing disturbance things, uh, walking around, 
living, making noise, all sorts of things. Maybe also their cats, their dogs, their cattle, whatever else they've dragged in there with them. Maybe all of those things are um, driving off predators and changing the dynamics of the whole um, kind of trophic web, all of the, the animals that would prey on each other or not in a given area. So obviously if these animals are driving off predators, you might think that's actually quite good for some species because they're no longer being eaten. But it can also be that all of this just disrupts which animal eats which animal and how many are left over. And so that actually can swing things to favor another species or another group of species. And so it shifts the whole dynamic and suddenly you've got different animals that you're finding in much larger numbers. It also might be that the initial disturbance associated with setting up a city can drive off organisms that can then never return. So maybe these animals actually could, for some reason or another, live in the city quite well. It's just that there was so much disturbance when people showed up, started moving giant blocks of rock around and plowing fields and whatever else they're doing, that that was such a big disturbance that the animals were no longer interested in coming back. So it, was, it you know, scared them for too long or they were unable to cross over a canal or a ditch or something, so they just weren't able to get back in. There are all sorts of possibilities to explain this pattern. But in general, it seems that some organisms can take advantage of human resources, while others are able to, unable to put up with a disturbance, or you've got kind of both of these things happening at once, and that's why you end up getting these very distinct types of assemblages, depending on the type of environment. Now we know that in modern cities, the biodiversity patterns can be really complex. So there can be areas where there are really high species richness levels, and this depends on the characteristics of specific neighborhoods and the linkage or lack thereof of different habitat patches. So I mentioned Central Park earlier. There are other places as well, if you kind of look at any city really, where you know you're going to have a bit more greenery and others where it's going to be a bit more kind of um, impervious surface, lots of buildings, that sort of thing. So just thinking about Falmouth, for example, you know that Kimberley Park is quite a nice green area. You know that um, just a little bit down the road, as you exit Falmouth and drive towards Penren, all of a sudden you've got commercial road, you've got basically one building after another going up into the water, and so basically there is no habitat for birds uh, or for other wildlife on that kind of side of the road. Now there might be across the road where there's that um, you know, nice kind of hill with trees and, and bushes and things kind of on the other side of Little, for example. But that's on the other side of the road and animals might have a hard time crossing over. So if you kind of think about these sorts of layout things, you think maybe that hill across from Little is a nice place for the animals to live. Maybe Kimberley Park is a nice place to live. But it's quite hard for animals to get in between those two places. So if you've got corridors that kind of connect those, that can really be good for wildlife. Or if you've got more uh, little patches in between Kimberley Park and that little green hillside, then maybe animals can kind of hop, skip, and jump from one to the other in a safe way and colonize all of those and do quite well. So if you think about kind of how cities are set up, those sorts of things can really have an impact on whether or not you're going to have those little pockets of richness and whether those are going to extend all the way across the city or just in one place or another. Another good source of um, places for animals to kind of either colonize permanently or travel th um, through and, and from is gardens. So we have a lot of gardens here in town, which is actually quite good for birds uh, and other species. Little mammals in particular, like they were looking at in this study here. So if you just kind of think about these little sorts of things, that is really what makes or breaks whether a city uh, or a town can be a good environment for the wildlife. And we do know that in general there are going to be core areas where there are the highest densities of buildings and impervious surface and human activity. And all of these tend to have the lowest richness, as you would expect, because that's just going to be the most extreme environment. You might find rats and pigeons and maybe a couple of other things, but probably, probably not a whole lot else. Cockroaches, maybe. But then, as you go away from that, you tend to have kind of what these authors refer to as the fringe areas. And these are the areas that have uh, the greatest amount of vegetations and also the greatest diversity. So you've got plants, you've got insects, you've got other animals, you've got uh, fungi and lichens and all sorts of things that are quite happy to colonize these areas that are a bit less disturbed. And I mean all sorts of different disturbance, whether it's chemical or noise pollution I already mentioned that's quite bad for animals. Um, 
the traffic, even just the foot traffic or cars, because you know insects getting across roads can be hit by cars. So as you um, decrease the amount of those things you see, all this wildlife is going to do better and better, and these fringe areas are the places where that can happen. So what, uh, worldwide, we tend to find that there are only a handful of commensals that tend to be found again and again in urban areas. And you do see some diversity depending on a particular region. So Australia might have a few species that we don't have here in England, for example. But you also will find the same species over and over again, regardless of continent. So I keep mentioning pigeons, uh, things like rats, things like cockroaches. You often will have these introduced species that you find pretty much everywhere because they are so good at following humans around and living in these habitats. And these, um, these kind of homogeneous sorts of collections of species, these are what we tend to see more and more of and that we're trying to avoid because we want to maintain that diversity. And we do tend to find over and over that the diversity gradient is mirroring the urbanization gradient. So we start to lose the diversity as we become more and more urbanized because we're losing those nice green fringe areas. Now the patterns found in the current study are quite similar to those, as I said earlier, that are found in modern cities. So there are these winter cities, uh, sorry, winter species, the species that's maybe the, the one or two dominant species in an urban area. These guys probably benefit from being able to eat human food scraps and from being released from predation pressure. So in this study here, these are probably um, predominantly the mice that they were looking at. They're able to outcompete other species and exclude them. And these patterns can also be driven by more widespread patterns associated with the overall landscape. So an ability to put up with pollutants, um, ability to put up with certain types of, of layout. Uh, maybe they don't need to travel very much, so they don't have to worry if there's a road in the middle of the habitat, for example. And in general, we tend to find that kind of the winter species pattern is um, similar across all urban settlements. So in only one study that the authors were aware of, has anyone else found a different pattern where you actually have greater diversity within settlements than in the rural areas around it? And this is actually found uh, in the Maasai settlements in East Africa. So for whatever reason, when the Maasai move in, it, te it seems to be quite good for biodiversity. So maybe that's because there are um, commensals that are following them around. Maybe it's parasites associated with their cattle or, or other insects that do quite well when there's the cattle dung that, um, that they introduce into the habitat. Who knows what it is exactly? But there are these, um, there is this one particular pattern here and nowhere else, pretty much everywhere else around the world from continent to continent, they always found that there's bigger biodiversity outside the city than on the inside. And on the inside, you've always got that winter species. And this suggests that Overall, across time and around the world, the human transition from mobility to kind of a sedentary lifestyle, living in cities, this facilitated the success of very particular species, both those that are unique to particular areas and also those that we kind of introduce everywhere we go. And these guys basically ride our coattails. And so as we grow, so they grow as well and do quite well. And the patterns that we find in urban areas are just a very extreme version of this, associated with the lowest number of successful commensals. But kind of elsewhere, along the uh, development gradient, you might find similar patterns. So whether we're talking about t towns and villages, um, to maybe you know one little house all by itself to nothing at all, you basically have this kind of gradient along which the authors are saying, you're going to find some level of this effect. It's just most extreme in cities, but you would find it elsewhere as well. And this, in turn, suggests that the fairly good levels of biodiversity that we observe w right now within these low-density sprawl areas is actually a deviation from this kind of overall trajectory that we can expect to see everywhere. So finally, all of this research brings us back to that initial question. Is this kind of green area that we see in a lot of cities, is this kind of a, a temporary thing that we're kind of experiencing right now as a bit of um, a, a positive, beneficial, temporary side effect, or is this maybe a status quo that we can maintain? And the authors say, you know, basically throughout all of these cities that they surveyed, it's always a trajectory where the more urban you become, the less biodiversity there is. And it's going to be really hard to get away from that pattern. So right now we do have these little areas that they refer to as the sprawl areas where you have this biodiversity, but they think that that's a temporary thing and that as we continue to 
to urbanize areas, we're going to eventually get rid of those. We're going to maybe build them, uh, build on top of them. We're going to have more people. Maybe we're just going to, you know, leave them where they are, but we're going to be building elsewhere. And for whatever reason, either one of those things is going to make it difficult for the organisms to live in those spaces. And eventually, we will be pushing them out, killing them off, removing their resources, whatever exactly will happen, we will diminish their population so we're only left with a couple of winter species wherever we go and we're going to eventually lose these really nice green biodiverse areas. And of course that's negative for a variety of reasons, not just for those of us who like biodiversity and want to see wildlife, but also because these things can be tied very uh, closely with human health, both mental health and physical health. Uh, and also ecosystem services. So it's quite a good idea to try to preserve these animals and other species. Sorry, I keep saying animals, but of course I mean all wildlife. So this sounds a bit depressing. Um, and they say that, you know, they have actually seen this before. So in 15th century London, there was kind of a bit of a, an urban renewal and growth period. And they saw a similar phase where they had um, kind of this temporary middle ground when they're um, were cities that were lingering at one point of the urbanization trajectory. So kind of London and its surrounding areas. They got to this point, they had a lot of money, they were interested in lots of nice things like gardens and uh, parks. And so they were able to preserve those habitats for a while, and then that period of stasis ended because they kept urbanizing and they pushed through it, and the biodiversity went down again. So they're suggesting that uh, we might go through a phase like that now. So we're kind of hovering at that nice point, but as we push through, it's going to decline again in the future. However, they do also say that it's, um, you know, there are techniques that are available potentially to break these patterns. And now that we're aware of this, and aware of the likelihood that we're going to be going down this particular trajectory, we can try to implement those techniques and and basically pause ourselves where we are now, maybe even increase biodiversity again and go back the other direction. So we're talking about things like rooftop gardens and vertical gardens, um, kind of setting aside certain areas as uh, conservation areas so they can't be touched ever, so maybe that will ensure that we never do actually build in those places and get rid of the wildlife that are living there. All of these things and more, we could potentially, now that we're aware of this pattern, make sure that we emphasize this stuff and try really hard to prevent this decreasing of biodiversity. Now, the authors aren't sure of this. This is just kind of their um, guess, and they're suggesting that we need to investigate this more in, um, in the future and other studies, maybe run some computer simulations to get an idea of what might happen over time if we do certain types of things in certain types of areas. But it is their hope that now that we are armed with this knowledge, uh, have an idea of ancient trajectories and modern trajectories and how very similar they are, that we can prevent ourselves from going down that very same path um, that our ancestors went down in the past when they lost a lot of the biodiversity in their cities. Welcome back to The Wild Side. This is your host, Caitlin Kite, and that was Wilco with Capital City and the Tony Rich Project with Grass is Green. And if you're just now joining me on today's show, uh, I will tell you that before the break I was talking about the trajectories of urbanization and how they impact wildlife in a particular area. So there were some authors that studied a range of archaeological sites in the Middle East and found that as those ancient sites were developed, the more urban they became, the fewer species they had, and that the species they had were very specific to urban sites versus rural sites versus sites that had once been inhabited and then um, were abandoned by people. And the upshot of this particular study was that they suggested that perhaps rather than going down this route again, we can put a stop to this pattern by introducing lots of techniques like rooftop gardens and vertical gardens and things like that into our cities preserve parks and gardens and other areas to ensure that we never lose any of the biodiversity that we want to have living with us and making our lives more attractive, performing ecosystem services, and so on. So moving on from that, I want to think about an, a study that also is quite recent that actually kind of looks at this a little bit and finds that maybe that is not going to be quite as easy uh, as it might sound like it's going to be. So just to give you a little background, this will be the, some of the same stuff that I mentioned earlier in the show, but if you are just joining us, I want to 
give you the tools you have uh, that you need in order to understand what I'm talking about. So we know that urban areas are drastically altered relative to natural areas. That's quite obvious. And some of the changes include the introduction of non-native species, um, the presence of impervious surfaces, so things that change how water runs through the soil, the presence or absence of structures and other topographical features, and also the presence of pollutants, so things like light and noise and chemicals. And all of these things tend to drive out sensitive species and often kind of specialist species, but they also can be very useful to some organisms that we refer to as commensals. And for the one or two species that kind of predominate, um, we call these things the winner species. And these guys tend to benefit from a reduction in predation, from additional resources from humans, so whether that's a nesting cavity or trash that they might eat. Um, and there's also a lot of vegetation that we tend to introduce. And so this is where the kind of the question comes into play. When we introduce vegetation, is it better than having no vegetation at all? So this non-native stuff that we introduce, so maybe the sorts of things that we might be planting on a rooftop garden or on a vertical wall or in a park, um, along a strip of sidewalk, in the middle of the road, you know, all this stuff that we kind of introduce to make things a bit prettier. Theoretically, this would be better than having no vegetation at all because there might be some organisms that can live in those areas and benefit from it. But, and this is the question that the authors of this particular study were looking at, is this stuff that we're introducing actually not going to be very good for the wildlife that live there? So all this stuff might actually act as a sink or as a trap. So there might be lots of wildlife that are attracted to this area or this type of area and then they don't do very well there because it looks like a nice site, but then once they're there, they're predated or they get poisoned by chemicals on the leaves or um, the ones that aren't mobile, they, they get there and then suddenly they can't find any food, but they're stuck there. So there might be all sorts of reasons why this actually isn't the best habitat ever, even though at first glance it looks like something that's quite nice and quite useful. And you know, there are lots of things that, lots of different characteristics that might affect this. So, for example, are you a canopy feeder? Are you a ground forager? Are there other variations like this that might impact whether or not these sorts of sites are useful? So the authors of this particular study wanted to think about this kind of um, natural versus human introduced vegetation in a city and look at whether it's actually uh, useful for species that are trying to live there. And they did this in Singapore, which of course as a, a nation state is quite urbanized because it's very small but it has lots and lots of people, lots and lots of activity, um, in incredibly dense, lots of buildings and roads and other sorts of features. But despite all that, it does have many little pockets of natural growth, so places where they have um, kind of maintained what was there beforehand because they built around it and never needed to take down the trees or take out the grass. And they also have pockets of, you know, gardens and other features that humans have introduced. So you've got a little a mixture, so things like parks and gardens and lawns and golf courses, but also these undeveloped strips and also even some forests that are found alongside roads. And in these areas, the authors selected two, um, sorry, not two, 42 500 meter long transects. So basically just a nice straight line through the habitat and they could walk along that habitat and look at all the different species that were there to see how many different organisms are utilizing these areas. And in this study they focus mainly on birds and butterflies. And these guys are quite nice because you can see them very easily and therefore count them very easily. So they went through every two months and they repeated these surveys where they're looking at all the birds that were within 50 meters of the transect and all the butterflies that were within 20 meters. And this allowed them to create a single measure of um, the total community per site. So what were all the different species that were found in an area? And this allows them to know not just how many species there are, but what types of species. So what things are found with other things? Are there some species that are found in some of these sites and not others? So you get kind of an idea of um, who is using this habitat and kind of why. While they were conducting the surveys, they also looked at a number of kind of physical features in order to get an idea of what are the characteristics of those habitats that are influencing whether or not there's much biodiversity there. So they looked at canopy cover, shrub cover, ground cover, and all of these things together, so just total greenness. 
um, whether the vegetation that they were looking at was cultivated and introduced by humans, so kind of on the golf course end of the spectrum, or whether it was natural, so that kind of uh, forested leftover patch kind of stuff. And they also looked at whether within kind of the category of natural vegetation, it was forest or scrub, so kind of tall, closed canopy sorts of patches of trees, or selections of grasses and herbs and other small woody plants. And the other thing they looked at was the density of nearby road lanes. And they threw all of this stuff into some computer models in order to figure out which of these physical features had the biggest impact on the amount of biodiversity that they were seeing in an area. Now overall, they counted over 20,000 individuals of 136 bird species, and also almost 6,400 individuals of 106 butterfly species, which is really quite impressive considering, again, that this is in a highly developed city. They're still finding thousands of organisms and hundreds of species, which actually is quite um, a pleasant surprise. And now the transect richness, though, if you think about this a bit separately, it ranged quite a lot. So in some areas they had as few um, as uh, 17 different bird species, but in others they had 58. With the butterflies, it ranged from 6 species to 51. So clearly there are some patches that are better than others for birds and butterflies to live in. Bird species richness was bet best predicted by the number of cultivated trees, the presence of traffic, the interaction between these two terms, the amount of natural vegetation, and to some degree, the amount of ground cover. So what does all of this mean? Well, the more traffic there was nearby, the fewer species there were. The more ground greenery there was, the fewer species they were. So this indicates that kind of being in open, exposed areas maybe wasn't so good for these birds. The effect of trees and natural greenery, both, these were positive things, so the more trees there were and the more natural the habitat was, the more species there was, there were, sorry. The most interesting thing, I think, is the interaction term. So this suggests that um, when you've got a lot of canopy cover, this actually can help buffer birds from the negative impacts of traffic. So when you've got um, traffic and low levels of trees, that's quite bad for wildlife. But as you've got uh, that increasing amount of tree cover, that actually slows down the bad effects of traffic and kind of buffers the birds so that you still can have uh, high biodiversity levels even though there is traffic nearby. But again, only in areas where there are lots of trees. Not too dissimilar was butterfly species richness, which was best predicted by the amount of natural vegetation again, and also the amount of traffic. And just as you expect, natural vegetation had a positive impact and tra traffic had a negative impact. And there was some very small positive effect of cultivated greenery, which is kind of a good sign. But of all the relationships that they described here, the strongest and the, really the most obvious, the ones that were having the biggest impact, were the positive effects of natural vegetation across both of these two groups and also the negative effects of traffic. So the other stuff were kind of little minor things that are kind of interesting and may reflect conditions at you know a couple of sites, but across all of the sites you do see these two patterns with the traffic and the natural vegetation. So even though there are some things that may help some species in some areas, there are also these other things that definitely help all species, and that is uh, a large number of natural um, types of vegetation and kind of natural growth areas and no cultivation. So what does all of this mean kind of in the real world? Well, clearly natural vegetation is likely um, quite important to both birds and butterflies because it has uh, it provides the opportunity for nesting spaces and shelter and food and all sorts of things that these animals need in order to stay safe and to stay well fed for long enough to survive and breed. That said, there's also a specific relationship between biodiversity um, and both canopy and turf. So basically, when you've got lots of canopy and, and little turf, this works out pretty well, which suggests that even though generally speaking it's better to have natural stuff, if you could cultivate spaces that did emphasize more canopy and less turf, they might also be useful. Now they're not going to be as useful as the natural spaces, probably, but they might be better than nothing. So it's worth kind of emphasizing these things as they go about doing 
kind of landscaping and urban planning. Now large trees are probably important because they have multiple simultaneous uses and may also kind of um, reach across roads and other open spaces so that it decreases the amount of time that birds and butterflies are out in the open as they're moving from one patch to another. Now while the plant diversity that's found in um, natural areas tends to be kind of fairly diverse, the, what, sorry, that, of course, that was a bit of a circular statement. While there tends to be higher plant diversity in natural areas, there tends to be lower plant diversity in urban uh, and developed and cultivated areas. And so it seems to be that kind of where the plant diversity goes, so too does the animal diversity. And what the authors are warning here is that if we want to prevent homogenization of the animal assemblages, we also need to uh, prevent the homogenization of the, the vegetation as well. And basically, once you lose that natural vegetation, you're probably not going to make as much of a difference as you would like if you're then just trying to kind of backpedal and introduce cultivated vegetation instead. So overall, the study emphasizes that it is really important to have these little green pockets in a city but we tr need to try to emphasize that those green pockets comprise native vegetation that is left over as we build, rather than other stuff that we introduce after we've kind of cut down all of the natural stuff that's found in these areas. And it's also really important to promote species diversity within lots of individual sites. So the authors did see variations from one type of site to the other, throughout the city. So even from one cultivated area to another and one natural area to another, there were these big variations in how many species they found. And this is actually quite an important thing because you have different little pockets providing homes to different, uh, different types of species and also to different individuals that then might disperse out and migrate and kind of uh, keep the genetic diversity going throughout the city. So it's really important to facilitate all of these things and keep them healthy and not just have a couple of patches here and there. So they suggest that we try to have as many different types of areas and as many different types of species within those areas as we can manage in order to kind of sustain these populations and keep them healthy and strong. So overall, the results of these two studies, I think, suggest that you know, urban areas are not necessarily the greatest for wildlife, but there is a possibility for us to pay attention to all of this scientific research and come up with techniques and come up with management regimes that allow us to preserve some of the natural um, organisms that are there and some of the natural assemblages that are there in order to keep nice, healthy uh, wildlife populations living near us, kind of making us happy, making the, uh, making the environment attractive, keeping the ecosystem going, and just generally preserving bio, um, biodiversity and wildlife so we can pass that on to future generations. And on that note, I will wrap up for the day with Elena Katz-Chernin singing... Or